I'm Pastor Bill Schultz with Hungry Hearts Ministries. I want to welcome you to our service on this magnificent Shabbat Shuba. Here we are in the days of all, getting ready for the most uh, uh, anointed and holy day of the year on the Day of Atonement. You just missed one of the most magnificent worship sessions. If you don't have worship vision, you need to call your cable provider and demand it. <laughs> On the other hand, if you had worship vision and you'd have been here in this worship service, you'd be passed out in the Holy Ghost on the couch right now, you'd miss the message. So I want to welcome you to our service, Hungry Hearts Ministries, is Torah Observant Spirit Filled, with the use of certain Hebrew worship tools such as this to lead. We believe that the Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, died to pay for our sins, and having accepted that sacrifice for our sins, we believe we have to live by God's laws and commandments. We're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we believe in using it to worship Him. And uh, today's message is entitled, uh, Good, Better, or Best. Uh, a lot of people hear that weren't here in the beginning. So there's a lot of things that you, know, you hear us talk about, but you weren't here for it. And so we're going to kind of fill in some gaps today. Before I do, I want to offer you Pursuit Magazine. If you'll email me at HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com, I'll send you this magazine quarterly for free. The only other thing I use your address for is to invite you to the Feast of Tabernacles. That's it. So ask for the magazine. We'd love to send it to you, and you can stay current with what's going on in the ministry. And it's got a lot of interesting spiritual truth that will really help you out. Um, way back in 2003, uh, we went to the Feast of Tabernacles at Perry Stones. Some of y'all know who Perry Stone is. Perry Stone, voice of evangelism, great evangelist, love him to death, think highly of him. And uh, we had gone to two of his camp meetings. Me and Miss Sandy, Miss Niece, our kids, we went to the camp meetings and we, you know, typically caused a lot of trouble like we always do. <laughs> Opened my big mouth and got made to go. It wasn't just her. She, she's the one that put me up to go into the meeting, but I'm the one that opened my mouth in there and got in trouble. So anyway, we go into a couple Perry Stone camp meetings, and we were beginning to have church that was better weekly church than what you find in a typical feast site. Now, y'all don't understand this. I tell y'all that. You don't understand. Brother Mac is about to get an education because he's going to spend the first four days at the Feast of Tabernacles in, in uh, uh, Fort Walton Beach, and it's going to be so dry. I was telling the nurses down in... Uh, in uh, corn that we're going to need to hydrate him. We're probably going to have to give him an IV when he gets back because they're they going to freeze dry back and run him back. But anyway, the thing is is that in the background that we came from, there was no spiritual worship at all. You had a few hymns and that was it. You didn't have any moves in the spirit. You had great teaching. You've got great brethren over there who keep God's laws and commandments, but they don't want any more than that. Well, we were hungry. We wanted more than that. I think the last time I was here was talking about the people who went to Cagua and they had to uh, engineer a crisis so they could leave. I mean, why you got to engineer a crisis to leave? If you want to do something different, why don't you just give them the right hand of fellowship, tell them how much you love them, and we're going to try something different. You know, keep in touch. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we wanted to get into more worship. So we went to Perry Stones for the Feast of Tabernacles. Perry Stones said he was going to raise the Tabernacle of David that year. No, wrong year. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's the next year. I went back. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so we're we're going to go to the Feast of Tabernacles with Perry Stones, and if you know anything about Perry Stone, he's he's very the Pentecostals call spirit filled. There's an anointed move. You hear us use some Gina Bean music. She was one of the lead. She and her husband were the praise and worship band. We didn't have praise and worship bands. We had a piano on trumpets. We might have a trumpet or two accompaniment for one song only. And so. We go there and we have this great spiritual move. People were coming up to Lanise and telling her, I don't know what you're praying for, but God says he's going to give it to you. And it's all these things are happening all over the time. And at some point in there, I went through the birth pains for this ministry, which culminated in a man coming over to pray for me, who I had no clue who this man was. For, for a time, I thought he was an angel just showed up out of nowhere, because he literally just showed up out of nowhere where I was. But I saw him on a film later, so I know he's not an angel. He's just a regular brother, and he was obedient, and, and the Lord moved on him to pray for me. But about three sentences in, it wasn't him praying anymore. You could tell the voice changed when the Lord came in, and I was given a commission to do this work. This work's a little different than most works. We get a right now word from Yeshua Messiah, and we follow that word. And it means we do things differently. 
uh, part of what I was told was that I would have to do things the way the Lord told me to do them and not the way I wanted to do them. And that I would speak the things the Lord told me to speak and not necessarily things that I want to speak. Now, look, guys, I'm just human. And there's been a few times when I said stuff that was just Bill Schultz talking and I've paid the price. And there's been a few times where I did what I thought would be better than what I heard for whatever reason and I paid the price. But I think everybody else is in the same boat, amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. You get words in the spirit, you don't always know, right? right. Of course, the problem was the ones I busted up that I knew. <laughs> and pay for those, amen? Yes. So when I got home from the feast with this commission, we went down to Somerville. Now, Miss Sandy remembers, we used to go to Somerville a lot, a little spirit-filled church down there. They started all this, right? So if you want to blame somebody, you can blame Patsy Adams, my <laughs> dear friend. <laughs> who started all of this by praying in tongues and convincing us that we needed to pray in tongues. And that was the end of us with our ex-worldwide split buddies because they, they don't do that. But that's what we uh, were led to do, and uh, it's never never been a bad thing for us to do it. So anyway, we get back there, and Miss Patsy confronts me at the coffee pot. It says, I have a word from the Lord for you, and it's good, better, or best. And I said, I already made up my mind. Now, I just want you to understand, this is I got this during the feast, good, better, bad. I said, I, I understand, Miss Patsy, because I don't think you do. I said, I understand, Miss Patsy, and I made my decision at the feast for best. She goes, well, let me tell you then, best comes with a cost. And best has come with a cost. Amen? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you go to the store and you buy stuff. You can buy a good quality item, and it's usually pretty cheap. You can buy a better quality item. It costs a little more. But you want to buy the best of anything, you got to put some money on the table, amen? Oh, come on now. And so uh, I made that decision for best. We could have done things differently in Hungry Hearts all along the way, but you wouldn't have had this great worship experience that we had in here today if we had gone for good. Matter of fact, you probably wouldn't even have worship in here if we'd have gone for good. Oh, you might have had a couple of little songs, but you wouldn't have had worship like this if we'd have gone for good. And you most definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, would not be going to have the Day of Atonement that we're planning on for this year if we had chose good. Amen. You guys just don't know how dry our background was. I mean, sorry guys, you know what it is. I mean, I'm not trying to be ugly. We all did it together for a long time. It's just dry. What can I say? And you don't even you don't even have drinks there. I mean, come on, it's dry. You don't even have any ginger ale. I mean, this is you know, what's up with that? We're spirit filled, and we have ginger ale. Amen. <laughs> well, some of y'all out there, TV land to get that next week after atonement's over. We have ginger ale. Look, this is the only church I've ever been, been in where we need cup holders on the walls. Amen. <laughs> John chapter three. John chapter three. <clears throat> And verse 5. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going, so it is everyone born of the Spirit. It has been difficult to try and get a right now word for everything we do in this ministry. Amen? I'm just like everybody else. I mean, I know some people think that I'm not, but if you have any questions or disputes about that, Miss Nisa will straighten you out after service. I wake up in the morning and I wake up poorly and I look bad and I feel bad and I think poorly. I need coffee and alone. There's a few people in here that can commiserate with that. It's not really a great life. Now, Miss Nisa, on the other hand, she wakes up happy and cheerful. What did, what, did that, what did that little saying go on a woman's desk? It says, you, you know, different times you know you need to pray. When that happy little, you know, word for a, a little girl, you know, a little girl at work comes in and she's just too happy and you want to slap the, you know what, that's when you know you need to pray. I mean, come on, she's always happy and cheerful and excited and I'm like, don't even talk until I have coffee. I mean, I, 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 I got blue screen on, okay? I wake up with the blue screen. I don't know if to y'all, but I got blue screen. My, my, my program's already been booting. Dawes isn't even running up the screen yet. Let me have some coffee. We'll talk with her. Some of y'all got that. The rest of y'all looking at me funny. Y'all probably wake up all happy and cheerful too. Ready to go. All systems booted it up. I don't know what kind of operating system you got, but crash that dog, okay? <laughs> Just ain't right. So try getting a right now word for everything you got to do. 
Try getting a right now word for everything. And hey, not only a right now word, but a confirmed right now word so that you can follow it and know that it's right. Amen? That, that's not as easy as it sounds. Sometimes I've been told to do things that are completely off the wall. Things that people at the time thought I was insane for doing. You know what? I thought I was insane too, by the way, guys. So, I mean, it's not just you. I thought I was insane when I did them too, but I got a word. And it's like I've told people before, you know, if you get a word from God and you think it's from God and you disobey it, you're still as guilty as if you actually got one and you didn't obey it. Huh. Just go back to the prophet. And the one prophet said, strike me with your weapon. He goes, no, you're kidding. And a lion killed him right there on the spot. So he struck himself with the weapon. I mean, see, you, you get into school of the prophets, I mean, stuff happens, man. You, you just can't take it for granted. One of the first things I was told to do was to conduct a feast site without any funds and to hold back praying in tongues. Now, how are you going to do that? We did it. Well, we sort of did it. The hungry horse part of the team did it. <laughs> Three years we had to do it that way. I'll never forget Miss Frieda in 05 when she first came to the feast. She was having such a blast. She kept coming over to me and grabbing me. And you know, she'd get up on your side. Oh, Bill, this is so great. This is so great. I've never been nothing like this. How come we can't pray in tongues? Well, honey, it's like, see all these people out here? None of them pray in tongues. They're going to freak out if you do that. They won't freak out. Yes, they will. They're going to freak out. They're going to freak out bad. So we didn't have any money. How do you conduct a feast with that money? You know, I've been a feast coordinator for Ray Wooten for two years, uh, 01 and 02. And... You know, he, he was a pretty tightly held ministry, and I understand. But even with what I got to do, I understood how much work and how much resources and how much money was required. Man, I'll never forget writing the, well, watching him write the rent check for $14,000. I was freaking out. That's a lot of money. People don't realize how much it costs to go to Feast Tabernacles. Ah, uh, now they want my offering. Well, no, if you want a place to go, they got to pay the rent. That's what they want. They want the rent. <laughs> the rent's the biggest single. So we're going to pay almost nine this year. Just our feast site. We're going to pay almost nine. We're going to bankrupt the ministry this year. It's going to be the best site we ever had. So enjoy it. Enjoy it. We're going to bankrupt the ministry. So enjoy it. It's gonna... <laughs> Maybe I'm going to do it again next year. So enjoy this year because it's, it's going to be stout, man. Get the early late late. Get the early late late. That's it. Get your use out of this. But we did it. We borrowed fourteen thousand dollars, and Lenise and I throw in almost all of our feast tithes. Then we made the feast happen. Now, the hungry hearts people didn't talk about talking in tongues, but it was all the tongue talkers that wouldn't talk about anything but talking in tongues. But we were told you can't talk in tongues. Man, right? People come out of the woodwork talking in tongues. Everybody was talking about tongues. We we were told not to talk about tongues. Shut up. <laughs> But they blew everybody up because they wouldn't quit. You know, a couple little things slipping out here and there we probably could have got by with. But people made it their mission. They're going to get all these non-tongue talking people to talk in tongues. And God said, don't do it. And they kept saying, you're wrong. I said, no, I got that word. It's clear as a bell. Don't do it. You know what you're talking about? Yeah, I do. The Lord said, don't do it. That's all you got to know, right? Good work. Yeah. So next we moved on to spirit without limits. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. Spirit without limits. We've gone to Perry Stones. We were on the uh, uh, prayer team. We got to go and work the altar service. We were trusted in the, in the daughter of Rachel prayer room. And we were always trustworthy in there, by the way. We never violated that trust. And we were good in there. And we were accepted in there. And, and we brought this to the feast starting in 07. So 07 to 11. We had uninhibited spiritual moves at the Feast of Tabernacles. And a lot of, some of y'all came in at various stages during this time. And it was fantastic, wasn't it? I remember this one that came, what, 08? Oh, was it 07 for atonement? Oh, wow. Man, girl, you've been here a while. All right, so verse 39, last half of the verse, do not forbid speaking in tongues. So we choked it back for three years because the Lord told us to because he had a lot of non-tongue talking people in there and he wanted them to get acquainted with worship and to be able to open up to him in worship in a safe place and so a lot of my tongue talking friends made it unsafe so next they're not coming back that's all over so we move into uninhibited moves in the spirit and we got good at it didn't we y'all remember that feast in 09 
when we, we did the, the altar service on the, on the last great day of 09, drink from Jacob's well. Oh my goodness, what a move we had up in there that day. I had never seen so many people fall out in the Holy Ghost anywhere I've ever been. That was the biggest move I've ever seen in my life for that type of move. It was fantastic. But it didn't work. Because so many people that were coming in and weren't moving the Spirit wouldn't live by the commandments. You wouldn't believe how many people were sneaking work on the Sabbath and breaking little commandments here and little commandments there. It's like, this doesn't work when you're commandment breaking, guys. Right. When you start that commandment breaking, it's a rolling stone and it just starts getting worse and worse and worse until your life collapses. So then we thought, well, let's, let's move on to classes. These people need more work. So we started moving into classes. Remember we had all those classes? We had so many classes you couldn't go to. We had three classes running at a time. We had films. We had films running. But it didn't work. John, let's go to John 14. Talking about the classes and getting the word. Because commandment keeping is so important. So important. Commandment keeping. It's so simple, right? Just live the Torah. I mean, the rules for personal living in the Torah can't be, what, three pages if you wrote them out in hand, handwriting? I mean, there's just not that many rules in the Torah for your daily life. There's a lot of rules for priestly stuff, which we're going to get into in the next couple of years. There's a lot of rules for national stuff, which is the sheriff and the city and the state and the fans. You can't touch that, right? So just the personal rules for how you conduct your life on planet Earth. It's really simple, isn't it? John 14, verse 21. I'm going to read it. The NIV butchers this verse. I've been in the King James a long time in this part of the Bible, so I can't tell you what the King James does, but I'm going to read the NIV the way it should read. <laughs> Whoever keeps my commandments and obeys them, he is the one that loves me. This word for commands here in the NIV is in tole, and it means the Ten Commandments. Whoever's living by the Ten Commandments loves me. Okay, so you got to have commandment keeping. But all those classes didn't work. It didn't work because too few people went and too many teachers decided that once they got behind their little Billy Pulpit, they were going to teach their favorite heresy. <laughs> I'm not going to name any names, but, I, but one person stood up there and taught. Y'all going to love this one. That black Americans are the royalty. I'm not making that up. The skin color has nothing to do with royalty. But I have a person in this room who was in the class. That's why the classes didn't work. If everybody was teaching straight Bible out of the class, then the classes probably would have worked. Now, I'm going to give you another one. Joe Perry, I don't remember which subject this class was, he taught a magnificent class, but nobody went. Miss Andy went, and I think Casey went. Nobody went. He's sitting in that class teaching that class, and all the people who need this word that he's given are out doing something silly. And then another time, we had films. We had great film. Oh, we had great films, man. If y'all remember, we, had, we ran uh, Ben Stein's Exposed. I mean, that was a great film. We ran The Case for the Creator by Lee Strobel. I mean, that was a great film. We ran great films. But when I got into, got into prayer early and, and sat down in the films while that finished up, I'm sitting there with Eric Kenson, my, my film man, and no one's no one's in there. He's running the films. And I ask him, has anybody been in? He says, no, I, I, I did just like you told me. I ran these films just right on schedule, and no one's been here. We were running films in an empty room. Didn't work because nobody went. First Timothy chapter 6. Got to be there. Let's see when it was something that they didn't that wasn't supposed to be going on. The room was packed. When it was, you know, I told Mac, Kelly Mac one time. I said, "Look, brother, I said if we get about two or three good heresies up in here, we pack this place out." That's what it takes. I mean, you stop and look at the people that got heresies, man. It is full. It is full. You hear me? There's standing room only for a little heresy. Well, the problem is that's not best. <laughs> that's not best. <laughs> 1 Timothy 6, verse 3. If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and the godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in strife, envy, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. I'll give you one. You want a good one? This is a recent one. I think we saw it on the Holy Day. I mean, maybe I heard of Michael Root. Michael Root. Okay, Michael Rood, <coughs> or whatever Lanisa pulled up, was talking about how he has discovered the bow markers to the sacred name. 
as if this secret magical formula of the sacred name is going to get him in the rescue. I didn't see that anywhere in the New Testament, but in, just in case he missed it, he thinks he's found it. So this guy is presenting some Israeli, I don't think he's an Israeli, he's a, he's a Jewish person, but he is just an American scholar talking about all of these documents he found with the vowel markers. Now, if you're familiar with the sacred name, it's four consonants, Yod, He, Vav, He. And so he was presenting all of these things that say that the Bob is a Bob O. So he's got all these documents he supposedly found. He didn't give any proof for this, by the way. But they have all the little the little doggish over the top of the Bob. So that makes it Yehovah. And so he's making a big federal case out of the sacred name is Yehovah. Now Michelle got it. But I don't think very many of y'all did get it. The Bob O can't be a Bob O and a B at the same time. It's only one or the other. See, Yehovah. See, there's no second Bob in there. See, for him to have Yehovah, there's got to be another Bob or a Bet. He's got no other V. If the V is an O, then it's not a V and an O. So he rolled right past that. We got the four consonants. One's a Bob O. Therefore, blah, blah, blah. And they run off after this. But he gets, you know, hundreds of thousands of views, and we're getting single digits. <laughs> Think about that one for a minute. Like one good heresy, one good heresy. But I didn't see anywhere where if you figure out the magic formula for the sacred name, that means you go to the rescue. I didn't see that. I didn't see it anywhere. I did not even see any place where you got to use the name because in the only place it says that the only name by which men can be saved, it's Jesus in the Greek. It's the Asus in the Greek. Paul's a Hebrew speaker. Why didn't he just write Yeshua in the Greek? But he didn't. He wrote the Asus, or at least the oldest manuscript we have says that. So just how carried away can we get on this? 2 Timothy chapter 4. Somehow, I would bet cash money that no one's having the kind of moves we had it here today. I just, I, you know, I put a little wager on it. I, I don't know if we could find a meter. We need to get a, a, a spiritual move meter. <laughs> <laughs> we redline that baby. I don't know what's happening in your church, but we redline that baby every week. Second <laughs> Timothy 4, verse 3. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears aside from the truth and turn aside the myths. Oh, yeah. Wasn't Michael Rude the one that said that uh, the ark was hidden underneath the temple mount with all of this sand hydraulics? But you've had a thousand years worth of Muslim engineers, the best of the ancient world, they couldn't find it. And you had a hundred years of the British engineers, the best in the early modern world, and they couldn't find it. But then it turns out the Temple Mount isn't even the Temple Mount, even though we came out recently with a scathing rebuke of those who have claimed to have found the Temple Mount in the city of David. But the Bible says the Temple Mount's in the city of David, therefore it can't be on the Haram El Sharif. So this guy gets it wrong, 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 and yet he's supposed to be the expert. Dude, I'm telling you, anybody that can't trim their beard that doesn't have enough sense to teach. <laughs> I said it. Get you some clippers. <laughs> now turn your ears aside from the truth and turn aside the mess. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of evangelists. Discharge the duties of your ministry. So all kind of people come to Hungry Hearts and want to teach one heresy or another. I've got a guy who wants to come to Hungry Hearts right now and teach us heresies from some, uh, I don't know who she's called in New Zealand. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the woman in New Zealand, but somehow she's supposed to be God's chosen to teach the whole world everything because of her great website, and this person wants to come and, and teach this at Hungry Hearts. And I, I, He didn't tell me that, but he told somebody else that who called me and told me, so I'm going to have to call him next week and say, dude, save yourself a trip. Ain't no point making that 17 hour run. You're not going to do that in Jackson. So you might have to go somewhere else. But now there is one up in Land of the Lakes, but they ain't going to let you do it either. So, I mean, just save, save the trip. Just just stay down there and pass Go County, and everything will be just fine. Is there one in New Zealand? Yeah, this one. Yeah, go to New Zealand. You'd get your plane trip, brother. You'd be, you'd be worth your time. So it's way too difficult to keep everybody on the same page or even on a page sometimes. 
we taught them to rescue. Who doesn't want to be rescued? I'm shocked at how many people don't want to be rescued. It has blown my mind. So for those of you in TV land, for a small fee on the website, Hungry Hearts Ministry with a Y dot com, you can purchase this. It's a definitive proof of the rescue. You'll never, ever not believe in the rescue again. We go through all the Bible, or a lot of the Bible. We just keep keeps turning up after you read this, so I probably need to triple the size of this book now. But anyway, you get this great book. Come away with me. You can get it in bookstores on Amazon. You can get it at uh, Barnes & Noble. Uh, you can get it Books A Million, but you have to order it. And you can get this online from us for a small fee. Our price does include sales tax and shipping, so that's one price done, and it's on the way to you. You'll never again doubt the rescue with this book right here. But you'd be amazed how many people do not believe in a rescue. And I'm going to tell you why. They're not willing to live up to the requirements for the rescue. Therefore, they just say there's no rescue. Isn't that sour grapes? Didn't we all read Aesop's? See, I'm old. I'm old. My grandmother read me Aesop's fables, right? When, when, when the fox couldn't reach the grapes, he just said they were sour anyway. Mm -hmm. See, y'all don't remember that because none of you guys were taught all this stuff. And so you just, whatever you can't envision, it doesn't exist. That's just <laughs> the millennial way of looking at life. If I can't think I want it, then it does not exist anymore. So it doesn't matter if it's real or not. If I don't think it exists, it just doesn't exist. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9. I don't know. I, I just I still can't get over the fact that people do not want to be rescued. Now, there's plenty of Bible that says Christians are going into tribulation. I didn't dispute that. But there's also plenty of verses that say Christians are going into rescue. And that is what the non-rescue people dispute. But there are verses that say God's taking people. So what are you going to do with them? If God says he's taking them, who are you to say he's not? Come on. <laughs> now, this is not a proof. I'm just going to throw one verse out here. Amen. The end of Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. Okay. So the, your salvation is wrapped up in his sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He took away yours. That's what we call salvation. Watch the rest part of this verse. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin but to bring rescue to those who are waiting for him. Now this verse salvation it is sotiera and is translated rescue three times in your New Testament and I think it should be fourth time right here. Actually I think sotiera should be translated rescue about eight or nine times based on context. Right. Because once you're saved in the first half of this verse, what are you waiting on? You're not waiting on him to say, he's not going to save you a second time. Right. You only have one chance at salvation. You get saved the first time. If you blow it, that's it. You're going to the lake of fire. There is no second chance at salvation. That you got to stay with. But he's coming back to rescue those who are waiting on him. Right. Well, you'd think that would be easy to teach. But evidently, it's not easy to teach because a lot of people evidently just want to go into tribulation. <laughs> it didn't work. Then the Lord moved on me heavily to get into Hebrew prayers. And we, we can blame Deacon Miss Michelle for this. She and Kel stood up there and did the, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew while they were signing it. And I'm sitting in the back feeling just completely pumped. Now, you know, uh, let me explain that word because some of y'all don't understand. You know, they pull a prank on you. They call it, you got punked. That's how I felt because when we started this ministry, we started doing the Lord's Prayer. We started with the Lord's Prayer. And I'm thinking, how did, how did we let that get away? I mean, this was one of the main things we started with was the Lord's Prayer. And now Michelle Bernard in Hebrew, and, and it's like it's like I was getting, getting whipped back in the back of the hall. I'm getting switched on the back of my legs. This summer, I'm old. See, y'all don't remember that because millennials don't, don't get spanked and don't believe anybody should be spanked. But back when I came up, if you, if, if you didn't say things exactly right, you got switched. I didn't say if you back talked. If back talked, you got punched in the mouth. And, and maybe a second time if you dared to get up fast enough. But, but if you didn't talk just exactly right, you got switched. So I'm in the back getting switched because I knew we were supposed to be doing this. And it's like the Lord said, what do I got to do to make you do it, boy? You know, and I'm like, yes, sir, I'll do it, yes, sir, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. So we did it, and we lost some people. We lost some good people because they didn't want to do it in Hebrew. But that was the next move. It was the next move. Now, we had somebody object to the, the, the Hebrew prayers where we have up here. And I, I forgot to bring my sedur, my little purple sedur. Now, a lot of you know what the little purple messianic sedur is. They're using every messianic congregation just about in America. And, uh, and who, who, you remember who does that? The guy's name that does that sedur. No, I don't. I have one at the house. Yeah, everybody, we all got one, but right. I want to say it's David Stern, but I don't think that's correct. 
I, I'm thinking, I think I'm remembering that wrong. Anyway, in there, he, he says that a number of those prayers go back to the, the second temple period. Okay, well, the second temple period is Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Haggai, right? Jesus comes along nearly 400 years after the second temple period. Now, I know the Shema and the Via have to go back to Moses. I think the Barku does too. I'm not certain. Those three go back to Moses. There's no getting around that. But then you've got the Hatsi Kaddish, which is an Aramaic prayer that's been adapted to Hebrew. And then you have the Evoked. So you have these prayers that we're doing, the Elenu, and these go back to the Second Temple period. I didn't think anything that Jesus didn't say. Amen. As far as the Lord's Prayer, that Jesus told us to say the Lord's Prayer. Think about that one. Yeah. Okay, let's go there. Matthew, Matthew 6. I mean, he said to say the Lord's Prayer. I mean, I don't even see what the objection could be to that. I was kind of taken back by that, actually. Um, the Lord in this whole episode told me, you don't know how to pray. And I'm, I'm like, this is a rabbi telling me this. Now, hold on a minute. Jesus is a rabbi. See, people, people forget that. They just think he just came up out of nowhere. Jesus is a rabbi with his own school of rabbinic thought. And we're supposed to be disciples in this school of rabbinic thought. But we're not. We're trying to, we're trying to Americanize everything in this book, and it's not American. I mean, you know, it's... So he starts in verse 5. And when you pray, don't, don't be like the, the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. It's like we used to do the little mini sermonettes in a, in a, in a, in a prayer. And when, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. That's when the Lord was telling me, think your prayers out. Don't just stand there talking. Sit down, put some bullet points, and then make some sentences, some prose. Draft some prose to make your prayer because you don't want to be heard for your much speaking. So say something that matters and means. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before him. Ask him. So this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, how would be your... He didn't say that. He didn't say that. Look at here. I have seen a 1611 King James Bible. You can't read it. You can't say what the words are. The letters are different. The words are different. None of it means the same. It looks like Gothic Old German. Okay, you go back to a thousand years ago and the English are straight up speaking German and he didn't say this. This language has only been here for 150 years like this. It was the Brits in the middle of the 1800s that codified this English language the way you're speaking it. We didn't speak it like that. He didn't speak it like that. He was most likely speaking Aramaic. So we got it in, in Hebrew, Avinu, Shabbat, Shabbat. I don't know what the Aramaic would that be. Abba, Abba would be the, for the Avinu, right? So he would have spoken in Aramaic because that's what everybody around him was. Hmm. Well then. So we get it in Hebrew prayers. It didn't work. Some really good people left. One of them, uh, I'm not going to name names was trying to discourage me just from doing this and dissuade me from this course of action by telling me that's priestly stuff. And when he said that to me, the light bulb went off. Ding. Hey, that's priestly stuff. We're supposed to be a royal priesthood, a kingdom uh -huh. of priests. Uh -huh. We're supposed to be lively stones forming a new temple. Yes, it's exactly what we got to do. I'm on the target. Bingo. Boom. What do they call that? Uh, J Dams? J Dam. Hit the target. <laughs> J then hit the target, baby. It is done. So I knew to move on it. So I gotta ask you, did we fail? Has the word of God that I've been given since I got commissioned that we followed all this time, was it wrong? Because a lot of people think it wasn't that I'm a sham. No. Joel chapter one. Just gonna look at the first part of the first verse, and then we're gonna do the same thing in Jonah. So just Joel chapter one, verse one. The word of the Lord that came to Joel. Flip over a couple of chapters and we're to, to Jonah, and you're going to see the same thing. You could have seen it in most any prophet, one of these prophets here. The word of the Lord that came to Jonah, son of Amittai. So, all, so the word of the Lord comes 
People get it, they speak it, and every time they are mocked, ridiculed, Isaiah was sawn in half, Jeremiah was thrown into a cesspool up to his uh, 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 armpits. I mean, look what they did to these people yeah. for speaking a word from the Lord. So I can't really expect to say I expected a whole lot different. If you're going to follow what the Lord says, you got to expect some opposition. Amen? Amen. So, how, did we succeed? How do you measure success in the spiritual realm? It's not material. See, if I'm going to measure this podium, you just get the, the measuring tape out, and you measure the inches, you measure the inches, done, no, it's measured. If I want to measure my bank account, the statement comes every month, it's miserable. If I want to measure anything else, there's a metric, and you can look at the numbers and see. How do you, how do you measure by how many people come to church? See, where Max is going to go for the feast, it's going to have a thousand people. It's got a thousand people. It's going to be big. It's going to be big. Try. Try. Brother Max is going to need an IV, y'all. I'm telling you, you see him first, you have to do it. He's going to up it. He doesn't quite know how dry it's going to be. <laughs> For that many days, by the number of people living by God's commandments, I mean, we thought we had 146,000 of them at the feast in 04. It turned out uh, by next spring we only had 38,000. By the number of people talking in tongues, doing Perry Stones, you can have a whole room full of tongue talkers. By the number of teachers, you can get all kind of teachers. What are they going to say? By the number of people who can say the Hebrew prayers. You know, many of my critics no longer have churches. All through the years, we've done one thing, they're all gone. We're left. And actually, right now, we're in the best shape we've ever been. we got the best people in the house. Let's see, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. Huh. I, I've been told to follow every fad. Got to follow this fad. Got to follow that fad. Every wind of doctrine, go this way, go that way, go here, go there. See, that's not what he meant by blown by the wind. It was not blown about by every wind of doctrine. It's that you've got to do things sometimes that don't seem logical mm -hmm. because the Lord has other information you don't possess. One year I was told, don't tell anybody they can't come to the Feast of Tabernacles. I had a bunch of kids talking about going up to a particular person's farm and committing radical immorality and doing drugs and getting drunk after the parents went to bed at 8 o'clock. And so, I, I, you know, I get really time constrained when we get this close to the feast and I just gave them a formal letter said don't come and uh, the problem wasn't with them the problem was with another person who got mad over that because their daughter had been in some problems but that's why I told him not to come it's because his daughter had been in problems and he got mad so he got somebody else mad and that blew the whole deal up but see the Lord's holding all cards and we're only looking at a card yeah <laughs> So we only see one little tiny piece, and yet whatever seems right to us may be perfectly right for the piece we've got, but not for the whole cards that's laid out on the table. The Lord knows your next card is going to be a king, and you're going to bankrupt. You're not going to get 21 with that next card. You're going to bankrupt. So don't pull another card. You may not win, but you're definitely losing if you pull a card. Oh, Y'all get that. Come on. <laughs> Instead, I get out of the Tillit and inquire of God. Isaiah chapter 8. I get out of the Tillit. That, that's my euphemistic way of saying I, I, I seek out the presence of Yeshua Messiah and I try to get a right now word from Him. What's going to happen? What do I got to do? See, when, I, when I'm in the office in there, it's not just to be in the office. Because trust me, I'd rather be in the, in, the, in the house a lot of times. But there's times I just got to have a right now word. What's going on? What is going on? What do I need to know right here? And there's a lot of times the Lord will tell me nothing. And there's times the Lord will say, keep your mouth shut and let it develop. There'll be times the Lord says, get that out of here. There'll be times the Lord says, you teach on this and this is the message. But whatever it is, got to follow it. Because even if it's not a word from the Lord, if I think it's a word from the Lord, then it's disobedience if I don't obey. Now that one requires some effort. Oh, come on, you think about that. How many times have y'all got word and didn't fall through it? Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah 8 and verse 19. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whistle and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should we not inquire of our God? 
Yeshua Messiah is resurrected and alive. He is not dead. So what could possibly be wrong with inquiring of God? Most especially on the important matters, the churches we know that settle for good or better are all gone. The big Sabbath-keeping churches have many people who keep God's laws, but they are not allowed to inquire of God. The headman will inquire of God. You'll just follow it. What about your life? Is he inquiring uh, uh, with God about your job that's blowing up around you as you go to keep tabernacles? Is he inquire, inquiring uh, of God for you when you've got a car breaking down and you need to know if I need to get rid of it or fix it? You know, well, What about your daily life? You know, That's great that he inquires of the Lord for what's going to go on for the ministry, but what's that going to do for your life? If you need to write down a word with your circumstance at your house, do I cut bait or do I plow in deep? I mean, you've got to know these things. Amen? Amen. I chose best. I chose best. Came to the cost. Best means getting your message from the Lord. Best means picking your music in prayer. I sit down and pick stuff I like too. Right? But the idea is to pick the stuff he wants mm -hmm. on a given day. Best means following instructions that may seem off the wall and being good with it. Right? Because you're told to do something. If you're not good with it, everybody knows you're not good with it. And then they wonder why you're doing it anyway. And then, then you've got to be able to execute it well. Right? Because you get this word from the Lord, you're thinking, oh man, I don't want to do this. Oh man, this is not going to work. And then you're you're not, you know, you're just kind of lack. Uh, then everybody else is going to be. Uh, and it's not going to go well. You're not going to get it done. And this is going to blow up. And you're going to be able to say it was the Lord's fault. You're going to you're going to eat it yourself because you didn't do it. You just kind of, you know, uh, you know how kids are. But when you get a word from the Lord, I don't care how off the wall you think it is. You've got to be good with it, even though you're thinking privately. Man, that's messed up. But you know how many times that I have thought that and it, it was amazing success? And then I'm like, man, you're sure you're brilliant. You're brilliant. You're absolutely brilliant. I'm such a stupid person. So many times, y'all just don't know. It's the long cars know. That's why they're laughing back there, right? Best means willing to take the heat for Yeshua Messiah. Best means being willing to take the heat. For Yeshua. Because if you do it and it blows up, you take the heat. You're not over there going, well, God told me to do it. You just let everybody criticize you and it's okay. Now, I want you to consider what we've, what we've achieved over these many years. We've conducted what can honestly be argued as the best feast site for 14, we're fixing to do number 15 years. Right? We're only going to have, we might actually have 60 people. Y'all know that? There's some people coming that I didn't realize that are, we might end up having almost 60 people. Okay, that doesn't include the ones from Savannah if they decide to come. That's just the ones I know about. Because the people, Savannah people, have been back and forth over the last few days. They're going to do it themselves. They're not going to do it. They're going to do it themselves. They're not going to do it. So who knows what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. But we'll have chairs in the hall. They want to come. I think they'll enjoy it. But this, is, this has been a tremendous feast site. And virtually everybody who's ever come is talking. The people who, who left over the tongue talking told me it was the best feast site they'd ever been to. All right, so I mean, almost everybody's told me that. Our churches are so small, we shouldn't even be able to put on holy days. We had, what, 23 was the high attendance in here on trumpets? Man, y'all just don't know. They wouldn't even let you have a church with less than 75 back in the day. You had to drive somewhere, right? We had 23 in here for a holy day. And it was a magnificent holy day. We had a phenomenal move of God in here. It was great. But well, we went to worldwide, we had 175 people just in the Port Orange congregation. We had 600 people in the Orlando congregation. There were over 100 in Lakeland. There were 50 in, in Melbourne. I have no clue how many were in the old Fort St. Lucie church because I, I never got it. I didn't know enough of them. They were too far away. <clears throat> but we would have between 800 and 1,200 people just for a holy day. That's a lot of people. That, 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 takes a, that takes more people on the parking crew than we had in here for church. Just to get that many people in and out of the parking lot in a timely manner. Yeah. Think about that. This wouldn't even make a good small group in a lot of churches. 23? 
you'd be one of the little tiny small groups, right? The ones that don't matter. <clears throat> we have developed one of the best, if not the best, Passover program in the United States. I've never heard anything like what we did for Passover. But see, y'all are just here. It's just your church. You just stumbled across us in Jackson, Tennessee. You don't know any different. We have an outstanding Passover, don't we? I mean, if you've been anywhere else, I mean, you really know. This, this is an outstanding program. We have an incredible mission program in two countries. We bought Joe's a car. We dug a well in Kenya. We built three churches. We got a three-wheeled, uh, uh, like the old postal carts for, for India. And we have published everything that Kelly Mack and I have written in India, 40,000 copies a piece. That's a work, guys. Plus, we sent them food aid. I mean, that's that's a, we bought them chickens, we bought them goats. That that that's that's a work for the tiny little bit of people we have because we probably don't have forty people at all the hungry arts churches combined. That that's a work, guys. Um, we got three churches in their own buildings. Man, there's a lot of big churches that their chapters don't have their own facility. The United Church of God. Went over here at the Masonic Lodge, right? They have to take all the Masonic stuff down and put all their stuff up, and then take all their stuff down and put the Masonic stuff back. Every single service. People used to fuss about North Court setting up the sound. Thinking, boy, this is nothing in here. This is easy. You got to run a dust mop. You get it really has all, and you set this. I mean, you know what? What? Oh, this is so terrible in here. Oh, it's so bad. We used to have, we used to meet in the, in the temple, and they used to have a Sunday church in there. We had to tear all their stuff out of the way, put all our stuff back, then tear our stuff down, and put the temple stuff back. That was, that was weekly. That was every single service. So, you know, you, you talk about Living Global, Philadelphia, United. Uh, Church of God International is the biggest of the splits right now, and they, they meet in, in the old Econo Lodge, which is, I don't know what they call it now, but they don't clean it. You open the doors of that building, it's funky. I mean, funky, like an old gym. Look, they meet in there, and they got to set up everything and take it all out of the building every single time they meet. And you know, we're on the verge of getting Athens into a, into a vine church so that they, they won't have to load it in and just set it up and take it down. See, now they're having... Go to the storage building, take it out of the storage building, take it to the hotel, set it all up, take it all down, load it in the car, take it back to the storage building, unload it all in the storage building. They do every single service, they got to do all that. And we're about to be in the Vine Church where all they got to do is set it up and take it down. <clears throat> so that, that's a big thing. The people who are coming to church in these three churches, people who are coming, are devout students of the Bible. Amen? devout students. Living by God's commandments really well. Y'all are some of the best people we've ever had at Hungry Hearts. And I can say that about Corinth, and I can say that about Murfreesboro, and I can say that about Athens. This is the best group of folks we've had in here. So look around. Congratulate yourselves. Y'all are the best group. We're developing really strong prayer teams. So if you've been to prayer meeting, your watch has come along. We're developing really strong prayer teams. We're going to be an effective prayer force. Amen. We have some of the best worship anywhere at any time. Right? Like I said, if you need worship vision, but if you had worship vision, you'd probably still be passed out in the Holy Ghost on the couch and wouldn't be watching this. But it was kind of hard to, to get get out of that and get up here and do this message. But, you know, the whole thing is that we have some really great worship and we're moving into praise and we're going to be having really great praise to match our really great worship. And it's coming along really well. And we have a lot of people that can do Hebrew prayers. We have people in here that can pray as good as the folks in the temple, and they've been doing it all their life. Amen. Most of our folks now don't even need the sheets. We can pray it by memory. A lot of them still can't do that. Amen. So we, we've come a long way. We're doing a lot of great stuff. So all of the many different elements of our program now are coming together in a very powerful way that's going to bring us very good results. You heard the word of the prophet last night when she said that repent because we're fixing to come up to a new level. Amen. We're coming to a new level. It's because we're bringing so many things together that are all coming together that are going to bring us to a new level. It's going to culminate between atonement and tabernacles. We come out of tabernacles, it's going to be all different ball game. 
And on taking all these new subjects, we've lost nothing from the subjects we already had. We've lost nothing. We started out with great doctrines from the old worldwide church of God, and to this day, we're holding those better than anybody else. Like I was talking about the rescue. There's a lot of churches that taught the place of safety. They don't teach it anymore. They've either abandoned it or they're in the process of abandoning it because they can't justify it. We not only can justify it, we have advanced the scholarship on the subject to where it's indisputable and irrefutable. So we've held to the doctrines better. We pray in tongues as good or better than anybody else. You know, uh, can't give all those stories because some of those are private, but um, we, uh, we get a right now word from Yeshua Messiah quicker and more reliably than a lot of spirit-filled churches that base their whole program around that. We're praying our, our prayers better. We're working on praise. We're going to work on a little bit of ceremony. Now look, I know that's a delicate, delicate subject. I mean, all the rest of the stuff I thought was pretty nuclear, but this is going to be even more nuclear than them all. And I'm going to tell you why. The devil likes to inoculate the people against any coming move of God. Let me give you an example. Right as the worldwide church of God was getting ready to abandon the truth, they started making limited introductions of praise and worship in some locations. So that praise and worship now became associated with the new changes, abandoning the truth. See, the next move is going into the praise and the worship. But the devil wanted it associated with abandoning the truth. That's why I made a point of saying we hold to the doctrines better than anybody else. But we're fully charismatic in our praise and worship. Who better to have the great praise and worship in the spirit-filled mood than the people who are keeping the doctrines? But to me, that was a no-brainer right from the beginning. Right? So we're moving into a little bit of ceremony. And the greatest inoculation of all is that the Catholic Church is the one that does all the ceremony. So we've all been inoculated against that because none of us want to do anything that they do or any way they like the way they do it. But there's just a counterfeit. Right. Now, I did that message in 2012 on our Heavenly Father. And when I began to study about how much music is involved with everything, when you get into quantum physics, everything is a vibration. When you get into Nick Tesla and you understand uh, electrical science, you understand that the voltage in the plug is not a current, it's a vibration. Everything is a vibration. Well, what is a vibration? A vibration is sound. Sound is a vibration. Vibration is music. And when you understand that the atoms and the molecules are arranged according to octaves, it's in the book, by the way. It's in the chemistry book. Yeah. It's, it's arranged by octaves. That's straight up music. Everything is singing praise to the Father at all times. Everything is singing. Your body's singing praise when your mind won't. Amen? Because your molecules can't stop praising God. It's just continual. So the whole point is to go through the Bible and take some of the, I hate to use the word liturgy because it's a bad word and it's tainted, but the bottom line is the priests didn't just walk around in a haphazard, goofy manner as they executed their duties on the temple. They had a liturgy. They had a program. They had a plan. They did it according to script, if you will, because it all had to work out at the same time, at the right time. It all had to be decent in order. And all these people doing different things, it all had to work together and arrive at the same point. Cooks all know that. All the food cooks at different times and different ways, and it all has to be done at the same time. So you need. Well, we got to put all this together with a little ceremony so that it all works out. We can all do it decently and in order, and we can all work together, and it all come out right so that we can have a great worship and praise experience. Amen? That's a lot. So we're going to have to have a little bit. We're going to add a little bit of ceremony to things like ordinations and weddings and offerings and our Hebrew prayers. And it's going to tie a lot of stuff together, and it's going to be magnificent, and it's going to make our praise of the Father glorious. So where do we go from here? Anywhere Yeshua wants to take us. Amen. Right? Somebody asked me one time, when's all this going to stop? The new things, the new changes, finding new stuff. And I said, I hope never. I hope never. I hope I hope Yeshua is always trusting us to teach us something new because we're following through on the stuff he already taught. And that we're moving forward in Jesus all the time. Some new thing and we get to discover. Look, y'all don't realize this, but I've spent more time on the coronation service than I have on all five messages combined. Why? It's the, it's the next big thing, right? We've got we've got three things coming up. 
and it's going to take a lot of my study time over the next year. So you're probably going to get a few reruns if you've been here a long time, but most of y'all had not been here for any of them, so they're not going to be reruns to you. And you know what? Miss Sandy and these could stand for a refresher on occasion. I mean, I don't do it often. But, I mean, you know, when I did a message last in 07 or 06 or 05, I mean, you know, we we'll hurt y'all to hear it again. Now, the least going to hear it six times, so she can be fried to a crackling crunch when it's over. <laughs> But the things that the Lord has shown me go something like this. We have many things that symbolically are arranged around the betrothal. Betrothal. You know, it's funny. I, I thought for sure Kelly was going to get married. He's not here, so we can talk about Kelly. I thought, was, I thought he and Jessica were going to get married by times. I really did. Matter of fact, I was ready to bet Joe 20 bucks on it, but Joe wouldn't take the money. He said, I, I think you're right. So we couldn't find anybody to bet they wouldn't. So we'd have both lost a 20 spot on this. Since they're obviously not getting married by tabernacles, but... Uh, I, I put together a betrothal and a consummation service because I got tired of, of doing them from scratch. You know, I did a real nice one for uh, Brian and Jessica Newman, and I signed it and gave it to the groom when the, when the service was over. My computer crashed two days later. So I've never been able to recover that. It was the best marriage I've ever done. People complimented me far and wide on that, but it's gone. I can't get it back. It's just done. So I sat down and I thought, i got to get this ready. Because, I mean, Mac is going to need it, and i got to have it ready. So I put together a betrothal and a, and a consummation, got it all ready to go. And then it dawned on me about three weeks ago, the Lord started saying, you need to move to do it a formal betrothal. You know, we teach on the Jewish wedding. We teach on the Jewish wedding a lot. But you see, it's not in the teaching, it's in the doing. And so I'm going to work on a formal betrothal service where we formally betroth the individual members at Hungry Hearts Ministries to Yeshua Messiah. And then at some future time, see Ms. Wanda gets this because she came in in the wedding dress twice. I remember that. <laughs> and we're going to do a formal consummation. Now, I, look, I have a lot of study to do before any of these things are going to happen, but I'm, I'm, I'm shooting for Pentecost on the betrothal. I'm shooting for Pentecost on the betrothal. It's going to take a lot of work. I don't know that I can get all that done. Because you see, to get a word in the Spirit is one thing. If I can't pull all this together in a word, it's not going anywhere. Then there was one where the Lord was showing me a couple weeks ago, and he was saying that on a future Feast of Tabernacles, for the last great day Hobdell of service, to close it out, we're going to offer the whole thing up to the Father. Because at the end of the last great day, Yeshua offers everything back to the Father. So that is what we got to do at the end of the last great day is offer hungry hearts up to the Father. And so a lot of studies got to go for this. We're not just going to do this willy-nilly. I'm not just going to do it on the spur. We're going to study it out really well, probably teach it on Friday nights a few times. But you know what? This is exciting stuff. It's exciting stuff. What new adventures are waiting? Let's turn to Revelation 19. Rescue, that's, that's something that's awaiting. Does anybody want to get rescued? Yeah. I want to get rescued. I'm, man, Jesus beat me up. Yeah, hey, there ain't no life down here. All right, Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. See, that's the whole point, making ourselves ready. First of all, are we really the bride? We've gone through symbolic steps, but have we taken the concrete steps? Not yet. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. So our things that we're doing, the, the worship, the praise, the, the living, the right living, the praying in the spirit, these things are our righteous acts. This is our white garment. Our white garments may be embroidered with all of the things we've done. Wouldn't that be outstanding? Then the angel said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. These are the true words of the Father. So I would have to say that getting married to Yeshua Messiah is the biggest blessing of all time. Amen? Yes. So getting ourselves ready for this wedding, getting ourselves prepared for these future events, this is the right now word. And look, for those of you that, that came out of the former Worldwide Church of God, you remember of the four great commissions, preparing the bride was the last one and the one we never completed. We completed everything up to, but did not include the preparing of the bride. That's the last one. We dropped the ball on that. And so that ball has got to be picked up if we're ever going to get into the end zone with it. Now let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Verse 11. We need that film. 
Matthew 24, and verse 11. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Now this word wickedness is anomia. So the increase of toilessness is going to cause the love of people to grow cold. There's going to be lots of false prophets that are going to appear and deceive lots of people. But he who stands firm to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. We have avoided false prophets. They come through here like a parade. And we, we have avoided them. And we have proclaimed the gospel not about Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. See, the gospel about Jesus is not telling you what he said. Jesus' gospel was turned back to Torah, the kingdom is coming. So that's what we teach. Turn back to Torah, the kingdom is coming. That's the good news of Jesus. We've stuck to the real gospel. We've avoided the false prophets. Drop down to verse 23. That time of famous says, you look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect if that were possible. So the false prophet here is the Pope. And so they have been deceiving people with signs and wonders. They've had their share of counterfeit demonic miracles, and they're going to have a whole lot more in the next coming years. But do you know enough Bible so that when they do these miracles, you aren't swayed? See, if you keep in Torah, you know better. Because no one who doesn't keep the Sabbath is from God. So you, you already know certain key elements that let you know, I'm in the wrong, I'm fishing in the wrong pond. Let's go to something different venue. I'm in the wrong place. I've got to get back to the truth of God in this word. That's why you need every every word of it from Genesis to Mass. Amen. Verse 31. The whole point is knowing Yeshua Messiah, and when you know him in person, you won't be deceived by an imposter. Verse 31, And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather the elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. This gathering is the point of the exercise. We want to be gathered. We want to be gathered out of here. But some people say the gathering is going to the tribulation, but that's not what the wording says. The gathering, the same Greek word for gather is the same one that Paul says. We'll be gathered together and taken to the Lord. Gathered together, taken to the Lord. This word gather is always used for the taking to the Lord and of the bride. Excuse me, going to the wedding. I think it's Lombano. But don't get I didn't, I didn't look that up. That's just off the top of my head, so don't quote me on that. So let's drop down to verse 40. <clears throat> two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. So one will, two, well, two will be in the field working away, getting our job done, getting after it. We're doing it, we're doing it, we're passing out magazines, we're getting booklets out, we're putting on meetings, we're busy getting the church stuff done. One gets paralambano and one gets a fee of me. It's all about the wedding. See, in John 14, he says, I'm going to take you to be with me. I'm going to paralambano you to be with me so that where I am, you may also be. That's paralambano, going to the wedding. A fee of me is translated divorce three times in the New Testament. So if it's not just left, it's I'm taking the ring off, I'm walking out, and I'm leaving. See, we're looking at left as he left to go to Kroger's. No. There's a whole body of people in the Sabbath community that think that the people left are going to be in a place of safety at their home and those taken are going to the tribulation. That's not what the Greek word means. The Greek word paralamano means going to the wedding. The Greek word left, me means you're divorced. Divorced. Take the ring off. Walk out. Over. We're through. <clears throat> Next verse, two women will be grinding with a handmaid. One will be taken and the other left. Same thing. Paralambano and me. So we're going to be getting after it. We're going to be doing what we're supposed to do. We're going to be just working our hearts out for the kingdom of God. And then the shofar is going to blow. And somebody's getting paralambano. And I hope nobody in here is getting a fee of me. But you notice everybody's working. Everybody's working. Getting it done. Doing the work. And Yeshua comes to take us to the wedding by surprise. That's the way Jewish weddings are, right? Only, only the daddy of the groom can tell him when to go get the bride. So what did he say? No angel in heaven knows. I don't have a clue. Only Avinu Shabashamayim, the Father in heaven, knows the day or the hour. Because it's the Father that turns to Yeshua and says, Go get her, boy. Go get your bride. It's time. He, he can't go until he gets the word from the Father. That's the Father's prerogative. We just got to be ready when the Father says, Go get him. Because if you're not ready... If you decide, oh, we're going to play big butt pies today instead of working the field. 
You see, we can always turn and get dirty. It's a hard part to keep your wedding garments clean. It's the hard part is to get being ready for the wedding and to be doing the thing you're supposed to be doing. Or is it hard? Isn't it that the easiest thing to do? It's just stay at it. You know, body in motion stays in motion. Amen. We see that commercial 40 times a day on TV. All we got to do, we're already in motion. All we got to do is keep on doing the things we're doing and stay in motion because we're on track. And then boom, rescue. Yeshua is so good. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a right now word from God. I want to thank you for watching. I hope this message was informative. I hope it really encouraged you to get into your Bible. I really do want to encourage you to go to our website or our bookstore and get this book, Come Away With Me by Bill, Pastor Bill Schultz, because this book is going to explain the rescue to you in ways that you will not be able to challenge or refute. This is solid teaching right here, right out of the Word of God. I also want to encourage you to write me at Hungry Hearts, M-I-N at A-O. L.com for your free copy of Pursuit Magazine and you can keep up with this. Hope you continue to watch us on Ustream and YouTube. We thank you for watching. Uh, Miss Sandy will be up next week and it's off to the Feast of Tabernacles. After Miss Sandy next week, we'll see you in October. God bless you and thanks for watching.